And uh, Dr. Heidelbau, since you wear both hats from the Academy of Family Practice and the American Neurologic Association, do you follow any screening guidelines in specific that you think should be looked at more closely or is the holy grail? Or have you made specific modifications either on your own or as a result of the United States Preventative Services Task Force? Well, Mike, as you remember, uh, I was asked to give the primary care perspective at the AUA meeting when the USPSTF guidelines changed a few years ago. And I, I have to admit that was probably one of the scariest moments in my life talking as a primary care provider at the AUA meeting about, uh, about the prostate cancer screening guidelines and the primary care angle. But it was a robust discussion. You know, your question is, do I follow any particular guidelines? The answer is I follow all of them. Um, the point is you have to have the discussion. You have to give yourself time to have the discussion. And you have to be able to, to address the discussion and the guidelines in the context of that individual patient. I think screening every man walking in the door for prostate cancer is wrong. I think not screening anyone is wrong. But the challenge that we have in primary care, and this, is, this sounds like a terrible excuse and it's not meant to, is that we are so pressed for time that we have to actually decide that we're gonna take the time and discuss prostate cancer screening with each individual man relative to his unique situation. In the last 12 months, I diagnosed a um, extremely agile, extremely functional, extremely intelligent and coherent 94 year old male with prostate cancer because he wanted the, the testing. He wanted the testing. We discussed risks and benefits and he underwent a biopsy and now he's working out treatment. That was his choice. He was afforded that choice. And on Christmas Eve last year, 2020, um, one of the most heartbreaking days of my 22 year career as an attending physician, I saw a man who's 34 years of age die of metastatic prostate cancer. Yeah. I don't know any guideline that's necessarily gonna prevent that. That's still horrible and it's still a disparity. But, you know, I just said 34 and 94. And to address everyone else that falls in the middle takes time, it takes engagement. Um, I've done a number of studies and we, we've, we've done a number of different surveys uh, across education uh, paradigms with students and residents and, and junior faculty. And like you said, during those years, just, you know, the, the thing was just don't screen anyone. Yeah. And so we used to say, okay, what would you do if you had a 60 year old man who walked in the door and wanted prostate cancer screen? And the answer across the board was you don't screen him. And we said, what would you do if you had a 60 year old African American man whose father and seven brothers had prostate cancer? And almost always across the board, the answer was you don't screen him. And I said, why? This is the guidelines say don't screen them. And it, it marvels us in terms of the importance of the discussion and the shared decision-making that we have to have. And you brought up a really important point because we are speaking to an audience of prostate cancer survivors. So if you have a family history of prostate cancer vis-a-vis -vis being yourself, you need to have that conversation with your sons about getting screened because they are at increased risk of developing that disease. You have to decide, are, are you gonna get screened? And that's why I kind of baited Dr. Powell a little bit before, asked him how early would you go? I sometimes even think in men of African descent, if you've got a family, you may even wanna start at 35, just to get that baseline PSA. And the 